I'm Stefan Bauman. I would like to invite you on a special journey to discover the splendor, encounter the grandeur, feel the excitement. Come along with me as we experience the thrill of painting outdoors. A three-day journey that will change your art forever. In one of America's most stunning locations, Mount Shasta. Everything you need to know is on our website, www.stephenbauman.com. My name is Stephen Bauman, and welcome once again to another podcast. Today I discuss with one of my students the importance of painting in the now. What is it that we experience that catches our eye, that little special glimmer that while we're driving by at 45 miles an hour in our cars and we catch something on the corner of our eye and we go, that's it, and we try to find a way to turn around and get back and at least take a photograph. What is it about that scene that captures you? And how would you capture that so that you recreate that same experience? So sit back and relax and listen in to one of my conversations as I discuss with my students about painting in the now. You have to focus in on what you're trying to say. What, what is the effect in your painting? That is the crucial element that you have to get. So when you're looking at a painting like this, there's nothing going on in the painting. In fact, some would argue it's just a really bad composition. But what makes any painting great is the element of light. So the lighting effect, it makes everything. Now, when I first looked at this painting, I said, wow. That is, that's a painting right there. You could stop right now and it's better than 90% of the paintings there. Now, you look at it and go, well, it's not good enough. It should be better. And I think I could do better. I mess up. I do too much this. I do, yeah. Well, that's just the life of being an artist. Get used to it. You'll never find anything out in nature if you're out dedicated to do original painting. You will never find anything out there worth painting without having to deal with changing and doing things. And when you're in my coaching program, what I do is I teach you the element, uh, the secret to painting, and that is to be able to create that element of light. And when I opened up this painting, you had me at hello. I'm looking at this and I go, wow. Now, no matter how, where you go or who you are, there you are. And you're an artist that just loves to overly detail. You like to put tons and tons and tons and tons of detail. And uh, the element of a painting, though, should almost feel like you're driving by at 50 miles an hour. You know, there are times when you're driving your car somewhere and all of a sudden, boom, the light was just, you know, the animals, the the, the, the geyser, something happens and it's like, wow, whoa, you know, but it, there's no place to pull over, but you got the impact. You go, oh, I've got to go home into my studio. I'm going to paint that. That element, that impact, that feeling that going 50 miles down the road and you see something, that's the secret to painting. That's how you want to paint it as if you're just driving by. Now, when you're driving by, that shock, that awe, that light, that bear, that thing that caught your attention that you couldn't pull over. And we've all experienced that as artists. That's part of being an artist is that we're alive. We see things. 
that element is what a painting should be made up from. So when you're driving by at 50 miles an hour and you see something, boom, you're not paying attention to the rocks or the trees or the little squirrels sitting on the stump eating a nut. You really are just paying attention to the immediacy of now, the effect of light right now, the feeling that, that uh, you know, hits you in the head and you can remember it because you know once you pass that that road that thing that caught your eye and you're going down the road yeah it's almost sears in your brain it's not about the detail nothing that you saw that hit you like that yeah there was a reason why you chose a painting in the first place this particular painting that we're looking at there's a reason why you chose that you chose it because you were driving by and you took a photo or whatever, whatever, however you got the source. But there's nothing in this painting that, you know, would stop, make anybody else stop. I mean, for the most part, my students, because I train them to be, you know, light people, people who can put light into their paintings like Sargent or, you know, Bierstadt or any, you know, the Hudson River School artists, uh, you know, I teach them to do that. And when we go through the museums, that's what we're attracted to. In fact, even the history of painting had changed during the Renaissance when they started manipulating light and not subject. Prior to that, it was all about subject. After that, it was all about light. I think this painting is of light. It's incredible. It's a beautiful piece. You had me at hello. It's not done. And my fear of it is that you're going to go paint in every leaf on every tree. And the thing is the painting's already finished and you don't see it. We don't recreate things. We paint illusions. We paint effects. We paint the feeling that rocks are there. They have to be plausible. You can't have rocks up in the sky. So you know, you, what you want to do is put enough information in whatever it is that you're painting so that the viewer sees it. Like, as if they were driving by at 50 miles an hour. When you drive by a riverbed, you don't see all the rocks, although you're aware that there were some. And so you do need the hint of some, and they have to be correct, you know, so that we don't hang up on it. You know, if you were driving by at 50 miles an hour and you saw this beautiful lighting effect of this light coming into this canyon with, with water, and you're driving by and you see the beach with the with the, the water on it and you see all those rocks and all of a sudden you see a dead body on the rocks what's going to happen your mind's going to go looking at the rocks and the dead body and you forget looking at the scene so everything has to kind of be in its place and so if you're doing if you if you're doing an area of beach you only put in enough rocks in there so that the viewer knows oh there's rocks let's move on Oh, there's trees. Let's just move on. And the brain works within a minute, tiny, itty bitty moment of time. And so it can take everything in and, and see the element of light and sear it into your brain. And if everything is as it should be, uh, that's all you need. You don't need all the other information, but it has to be correct. And, it, and nothing can be the viewer away like a dead body. That said, even areas that are broken up into like an area where you have a beach, one way that you kind of soften that up is that even if it's all rocks, nobody's going to know where this is. Now, maybe consider taking half of them out and putting in sand. Another element to make sure that you get it right is you want the perspective. It's got to be that immediate perspective. Now, they might have big boulders in the background and then little boulders in front. And the problem with that is that it messes with perspective to the viewer. Yeah, as they look at your painting, they're like going, yeah, I'm not feeling like it pulls me in. So the trick that you want is that the rocks in the beach up here are, that are in front need to be have the illusion of being bigger than the rocks in the back. So that it goes from small rocks to bigger rocks to bigger rocks. Same thing with the trees. Small trees, bigger trees, big trees. 
We forget that when we're doing rocks. We definitely have to do it with trees. That's kind of perspective, but even rocks have perspective. Even water does. So like if you have ripples in the water, the ripples in the front are bigger than the ripples in the back. And even you're bringing you know, the water kind of meandering towards you in these interesting shapes, the shapes all get bigger as they get closer to the front. And that's how you create perspective and everything kind of points in. And even when you're doing your shoreline there, even if it looks like it's all the little pebbles and whatnot, you can arrange them, put a little sand in and have just like the water meanders in the back, you could have sand trails that meander in the back to help bring the viewer to the background. It's kind of like the police department going, there's nothing to see here, folks, move on, move on. If you create a slippery uh, opening for the viewer to get to what it is that you want them to look at, and we call that eye magnets, you can draw the viewer in. And even then, when the viewer catches an eye magnet, they no longer look at what th that eye magnet's on. They just move on. You know, if you have, if you're going to put rocks in, you can organize them bigger in the front, smaller in the back, and organize them so that they kind of help, just like the sand, how they meander towards the central focal point and actually point the viewer in. You can organize the rocks to be bigger in the front, smaller, smaller, and arrange them in such a way so that they kind of snake towards the background. So that, again, you're kind of duplicating the river in the, in the forms of the rocks. And then lay a couple of sticks and twigs and things. You don't want to make it look like somebody's come out and sanitized it for your protection. And don't put all the rocks in. Nobody's going nobody's to see all those rocks. All I see, I'm, you know, when I look at your painting, I'm exhausted. Yeah, and when we, look at, when we look at really great painters, we're really amazed at how little detail there is in them. You don't need a lot of detail. It's all suggestion. And... To be able to manipulate that suggestion kind of becomes your style, you know? It's like what you choose to simplify makes you different than McVicker. McVicker has a way of, of uh, painting his plein air paintings in such a way that he directs, because he's a master painter, so he directs the viewer to what it is, and, it, and consequently he puts all the detail in that area. And so rather than a painting taking you a month to paint, it only takes you a couple of hours. Because it took you hours and hours and hours to paint every individual rock that you have here. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, uh, McVicker's paintings, if you see his studio work, incredibly detailed, exhaustingly so. You know, when you look at them and you go, oh, wow. But they're actually not. They're more detailed, especially around the central focal point. And you'll see like these beautiful Persian rugs and you'll go, wow, he painted every color, every stitch in that rug, but he didn't. He just created the illusion just enough so that you know it's correct and made sure there was no dead body in that Persian rug uh, so that you get hung up on it. You just look at the folds and you look at the color. It is as it should be. And then as we get closer to the center focal point, you get more detail. He's a master at doing that, too. And you'll see that with all the great artists like Richard Schmidt. It's all how you pick and choose to create. Because we all start off with the same landscape. We all start off with the same flower. And how you choose not to paint the detail. And how you choose to move the viewer around. And how you choose to put the detail into the foreground. And how much of that is. And how much light that is. All those decisions. That's part of being an artist, and that becomes your style. And people start recognizing your work by what you're not putting into the painting. As you think about painting in a different way than just duplicating a photograph, and then painting from photographs becomes kind of boring because there's no you there. There's no decision making. When you paint every rock, you don't allow yourself the option not to paint that rock. So let go, be free. Don't do the detail in your paintings until you have the painting in. Don't do the detail until you have your story, your central focal point, your lighting. Don't start the details until you get the concept down. Put the trees in. The patterns of the trees have everything to do with what you're going to see and not see in the rocks. 
Remember, you're driving by at 50 miles an hour. So draw the impact and patterns of the trees, the big areas of rocks, the, you know, the sand areas, the same thing with the water. Do you see water, light on the water? Put that in, just like you have. And then when you see the concept, you go, okay, I'm going to do everything I can not to distract the viewer. And part of the distraction is detail. I mean, when you look at your wife's beautiful face, chances are you end up looking at her eyes. If you don't, she'll slap you and say, my eyes are up here. And then when you're looking at her eyes, you can only look at one eye or the other eye. And then you, you can't see both eyes. You can only see one or the other. Yeah. And so when you look at her eyes, you don't see her nose because the nose is coming at you. The depth of field is different. Yeah. If you view, if refocus yourself and, and looked at her mouth after about 30 seconds, she's going to think, do I have spinach in my teeth? Because she's that aware that you're looking at her. And when you're doing a portrait, uh, the, you know, uh, I think Sargent said, I can't remember who said it, but he says, you know, basically a description of a portrait is, is a painting that has something wrong with its nose or a mouth. The reason for that is because artists over detail that. So, you know, you're going to do a portrait of somebody smiling and you end up doing all their teeth. They end up looking like they have like dentures on because we don't stare at people's teeth. So that should be a blur. But see, you would paint every tooth. You would paint the cracks in between the teeth and the receding gums because that's the kind of artist you are. And consequently, when you do that, you can no longer look at their eyes. And that's the key feature is their eyes. So when you're painting a landscape, the key feature is the central focal point effect. And it's not even a thing, it's an effect. So painting all these rocks is just crazy. They, not one of those rocks adds to the painting. You'd be better off taking the rocks off and putting patterns in of sand or, or a couple of boulders that kind of push you in. You know, you could, you could pull these together so that, you know, you could finish that whole beach instead of taking you three days to paint it. You could have taken it and done it in three minutes. And I have some really great artists that take lessons from me, like Paul. You know, when he first started with me, it took him six months to paint, the, paint a painting. It was so photographic. But now he paints just as photographic and it takes him six hours. Because he learned what to leave out, where to put your detail. You would do well at one of my plein air workshops. Because there you don't get time to labor over everything. We do four or five paintings a day. You know? And so you start learning what's important. And you start seeing how other people uh, limit the, the things that are unnecessary. And then you bring them home and you go, well, why do I need all those rocks in there? All I need is to, to finish up the, the central focal point area. Everything else is a stage. When we go see Barbara Streisand and she steps out on stage and she's in the, stop, in, in, in the spotlight and you've spent $200 to see her, are you busily looking at the violinist in the first row? No. You're looking at Babs. You're looking at Barbara Streisand. And you're like, oh my God, there she is. She still looks good with all the facelifts and things. She still looks like she's 22 going on 80. But we stare at her, not the violinist. So keep your focus on the light. Simplify this painting and get rid of all that rock. And you'll see that you have a masterpiece brewing here. And as far as being frustrated, get used to it. You always will be. That's just part of becoming a great artist. Once you lose that frustration, you also lose your momentum of growing. Being frustrated is what makes us great artists. If you're not frustrated, you'll never be great. So get used to that feeling. And I will talk to you next week. So there you have it. If you'd like to get more information about my coaching or my blogs, you can do so at www.stephanbauman.com and there you can register for a free book, Everything I Need to Know About Painting. If you'd like to get more information about coaching, the information is there on the website or you could just give me a call at 415-606-9074 
Again, my website is www.stephanbauman.com and my phone number is 415-606-9074. Give it a try. I do answer my phone calls, so just give me a call and let's see if we can crank your paintings up to the next level. Until then, do good work and always remember to paint with passion. Until the next time we meet, have a grand day. Mm-hmm.